Welcome to our podcast series, Raising Saints and Forming Scholars, where we delve into your questions about the world of classical education. We were made for truth, beauty, and goodness. Let's talk about it. In this episode, we interview Screen Strong and three parents who are concerned about the effects of screens on young people. One of the many challenges facing parents today is how your children interact and address new technologies, such as video games, computers, the internet, and cell phones. There are many differing opinions and approaches to this challenge, and each family must choose the one that suits them best. The following is a conversation about one of these many approaches. I hope you find it informative and helpful. See our show notes for my personal letter as principal of the school with my thoughts about this very important topic. We will also include a list of resources mentioned in this episode and more. Hello and welcome to Raising Saints and Forming Scholars. Today, you can see we are so blessed with a big table of guests to join us. I'd like to introduce to you two guests that we have from Screen Strong. Hi, my name is Mandy Hammond and I work on the Screen Strong team. We'll be speaking to the parents tonight at Holy Child. Hi, I'm Holly Kate Oldham and I am also part of Screen Strong's ambassador team as a teen speaker. We, in addition, have invited some of our parents who are very passionate about this topic, about uh, students and screens. So I'd like to introduce three of our parents. This is Mr. Indiana Jones, Mr. Douglas Coombs, and Mr. Daniel Dominguez. Um, And we are all here to talk about Screen Strong, which um, I am going to let Mandy take over and tell us what Screen Strong is. I would just mention um, the parish Uh, who we are so blessed to be aligned with, had reached out to the school so we could share ideas about who we would like to invite to come to our community. And we have a close relationship with Catholic School Playbook, and they had uh, also used Screen Strong. So this is where all of this, this came from. But I would like for you to share with us your mission. Sure. So Screen Strong is based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, Our founder is Melanie Hempe, and she started Screen Strong about 10 years ago after her oldest son, Adam, um, dropped out of his first year of college due to a severe video game addiction. Um, And so basically how the story goes is that he came home that semester and she had to ask him, you know, are you on drugs? Like he looked terrible. He hadn't left his room. And um, his game was World of Warcraft, was the game that he was addicted to. And he just looked at her and said, Mom, the game did something to my brain. And she has a nursing background, medical background, so this kind of sent her on a journey of figuring out what did it do to his brain. Um, And I don't have time to go into the entire story. I'll share a little bit more tonight. But um, basically, she sent him off. She called an Army recruiter (laughs) to come over and get him off of her couch and said, we cannot do this. So this sent her then on this journey of like going to conferences and meeting with neuroscientists and authors and people that were even 10 years ago sounding the alarm to what screens were doing to brains. And so what she discovered, she just thought, I've got to let the parents know. So she started educating parents about 10 years ago, and that has now morphed into us educating parents and students and teachers and administrations around the country um, and globally. We've got ambassadors all over the globe um, to on um, what the brain science is behind this. So when she started this 10 years ago, a lot of it seemed to be opinion. Um, you know, a lot of people thought she was very extreme at the time. She raised her other three children completely different, experimented the other way with their mm-hmm. brains and have amazing has had amazing results so now after all these years we've now come out with curriculum for parents for teachers for students and we're trying to really educate on the brain science behind this Mm -hmm. so what was opinion before is now fact through um you know research and statistics and things that we've really just seen over the last 10 years come out we now can say okay the people that were sounding this alarm 10 years ago we are now seeing these results now of this kind of experiment that Mm -hmm. the tech industry has done on our on all of us, but especially on developing brains. So our mission is to get that word out and to educate mm-hmm. and give parents enough information so that they can make an informed decision around yes. screen time. And do you have a personal story to share why you're involved personally? Yes, I do. And I always like to tell people this. Before I was considered an expert, which I still don't really consider myself <laughs> that, I'm just learning along the way and have learned a lot in the last several years. But um, we actually gave our children smartphones when they were 14. Um, they are now 20. 
almost 21 and 19. Okay, so when they were 14, we had moved across the country to Texas from Iowa, so it's pretty far. And there was a lot of mom guilt there, there was a lot of parent guilt, and I wanted them to stay in touch with their friends. Um, we were pastoring at a church at the time and really felt confident that we could have a handle on this. Like, it'd be fine. We've already waited. You know, all their friends have already had phones, so we gave it to them at 14, both on their 14th birthday, about 19 months apart. And I would say within weeks, if not, I mean, months, if not weeks, my husband and I were looking at each other and going, oh my gosh, that dumb phone. Why do we give him this phone? You know, we just start that detachment process started happening. The conflict started entering our home. Mm -hmm. No matter how vigilant I was to have all the parental controls on and to monitor all the things and to look through the phone and to have the conversations and to have the contracts and all the things that we thought we could do still things entered our home that was not that was not good um content entered our home you know attitudes and the way that my son was now treating me and his sister and I'm like what are you watching you know what's in you could just know this influence was happening and it was very much out of our control as parents and so I think that we really believe the myth that we would be different you know mm -hmm. we care we there's lots of parents out there that just give their kids phones and don't care what they're looking at we're going to monitor this well 2020 came along right before COVID and I met Melanie, our founder. And that was through a mutual friend who I was confiding in about some things we were dealing with. My daughter was dealing with anxiety. Um, I didn't even put the correlation to Instagram with that at all. And she said, you know, you've got to check out Screen Strong. So I was able to meet Melanie in person on a random trip to Charlotte. And it was a total God appointment because she sat down with me and she said, Mandy, do you realize the brain is not developed till 25? Do you realize? She starts explaining these little brain facts that I had no idea as a parent, okay? And some of these things I'm going, oh my gosh, this is this is huge, okay? And she said, you can take those phones back. And I said, no, I cannot. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? They're going to hate me. You know, I gave it to them as a birthday present. And she just really encouraged me. She said, maybe put your coach hat on. A good coach knows when their team's not winning. And it's take off your emotional mom hat, put on the coach hat, and look at your team. Is it winning? Well, no, it's not. We are full of conflict. There's fights over screen time all the time. Put down your phone. We don't have our phones at dinner. I mean, it's just rules, rules, rules we're trying to enforce. And um, and so that's what I did. I went home from this trip. I She had written a few little books at the time, and I read them on the plane. And I went home, and I said to my husband, I think I'm ready to experiment the other way. And, and he's like, all right, let's do it. So literally the week before COVID, before we knew that we would be locked in for so long, <laughs> we took away their screens. My goodness. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, and that's kind of the beginning of a crazy story. But they survived. My they kids survived. don't hate us. They might have hated us for a little bit or at least said they did. Yeah. Um, my daughter now recently found a letter that she wrote me during that time. It was hilarious. Because she's like, you're parenting the wrong kids. We're not bad kids. <laughs> but I really just had to go to them and apologize. And we did. And we sat them down and said, I'm so sorry. I did not I did not understand what this was doing to your brain. We gave this to you. And I'm, I'm so sorry. And that's what we have to do as parents. So that's what we did. And that's a long story to say. This is where I'm at now. A year later, I joined I the team. And it's good to get the context. Yes. I think also if we open up the conversation, it'd be good to define our terms. So we've mentioned video games. We've mentioned smartphones. Yes. So what else do we want to add? Toxic technology is what we Screen Strong is okay. against. A lot. I think a misconception a lot of times is, oh my gosh, you guys seem really out there, you know, you think all technology is bad. We do not. And I will teach this tonight in our workshops today to the kids that there are two different kinds of screens. And so Screen Strong thinks that toxic screens are not necessary for childhood. So we define toxic screens as social media, video games, and pornography. All three of those things are found on a smartphone. So it does correlate to that. Okay. So, so not use, all technology is bad. Correct. Right. And so using a computer it would be using a computer for homework is a separate category. Correct. That's not what we're talking yep. about. Okay, correct. great. Do any of the gentlemen want to raise a question? I think <clears throat> I think I could just relate to your story quite a bit. As a parent, um, you're giving you're ceding that control to the screen, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as a parent we we just gotta remember, um, for me as a dad, I think I've got seven children. So a lot of it is practical thinking, right? Mm -hmm. How do I remove this conflict from our life? How do I, um, if, if we got some attitudes going on or if we've got a lot of rulemaking going on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how do I remove that? And the easiest thing is just, man, remove it from the source, right? Yep. Just eliminate it yep. and it's going to be okay. 
Um, so I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, that. life's a lot easier. You don't realize it until you do it, and you're like, oh, my goodness, there's no conflict anymore. So it's when amazing. we talk about eliminating, I, I know you have, I think on your website, the term screen detox. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do know, I think one of our parents had different options of phones that you use with your kids. So maybe I, I'm just opening up the conversation yeah, sure. that maybe there's different <laughs> levels. Yeah, I mean, I, I first read Jing Twenge's book, iGen, mm-hmm. um, um, about a decade ago, mm-hmm. and uh, you noted that, you know, um, Steve Jobs famously didn't give his kids iPads. Yeah. Because um, people in tech know what these screens are doing to children. Um, the highest concentration of schools that have no screens are in the Bay Area. Yep. So, um, and that, that says something, because people who are who are aware of the hundreds of millions of dollars of research that have gone into addicted um, adults, but especially children, to screens. Um, a lot of that research is centered in the Bay Area <clears throat> and in the in the tech industry. So people who are more tech savvy tend to be aware of this a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the proof just wasn't there. So... Um, like when I gave my kid a a, a, a light phone, <clears throat> it, um, can you which, tell us what that is? So it's just basically a it's a basic phone. It has no internet access. It has um, calling, text, and that's all it started out with. And then they slowly added things that were optional. As a parent, you could decide okay. what to add to it. So they have uh, at this point they have maps, directions, music, note taking. So that's called a light phone. Yeah, it's called a light, light. phone. And, and it's a dinky little thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks about the size of a credit card. Mm-hmm. Thicker, of course. But, um, and so I, I gave that to him. And he was the only kid on a soccer team that didn't have a smartphone. And it was kind of shocking to them because um, he also didn't have a video game system. And they would say, what do you do with your time? <laughs> and he would think to himself, like, I have so much on my plate. I don't see how you have any time to. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like he didn't understand how they could spend five hours a night gaming, because mm-hmm. with five hours a night, I mean, you could be a master at calculus, you know, at, yep. at, at, at or the great programming books. or the great books. You could <laughs> mm-hmm. you could learn so much, and he was in. He was just absorbing um, Dostoevsky and learning uh, Python and JavaScript and. All so, these things, and so like, so there's there are so many things that we could do if we replace this time that our kids spend, yes. Yes. and especially with how bad, say, Instagram is for girls. Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I'd never allowed my daughter to have social media, and it, and it, I was very grateful that I was able to stumble on this before Jonathan Haidt released his the book, just documenting. Now that we we know, before it was kind of an intuition. Yeah. People who were aware of what was going on in Silicon Valley knew they were investing all this research and getting kids so at a very young age hooked. Jonathan Haidt is on your website, correct? Yes. Okay, yeah. Mr. Dominguez, would you like to show our audience the book? So this is the book. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, you were asking for a perspective. So I, I have the, the pleasure of raising two girls, and they're 22 years apart. So my oh, oldest wow. is 35. <laughs> And she was pre-smartphones, mm-hmm. and and it was such a difference seeing the world that she grew up in. So she graduated high school in 07. iPhones, I think, came out in 2012, right? Mm-hmm. When all of a sudden, and I remember, uh, what was it? Not Facebook. It was before Facebook uh, oh. of MySpace. MySpace. You know, I remember yes. how big yeah. that was. And yes. I remember her spending <laughs> some time on it. But, it, you know, and Jonathan covers this, you know, kids that grew up before the iPhones, they could do social media and they could e- uh, email their friends and stuff, but it was something they did on their computer for maybe an hour because they still had everything else to do, but it wasn't with them 24 mm-hmm. seven, you know, and, and they had time to read and then, and then do the other things that kids do, like go play and play sports and have sleepovers and call each other. We were talking before today. Now today's Gen Z's, they're like, they're afraid of a phone, a conversation mm-hmm. on the phone. They think it's rude that you would call someone. That you, <laughs> How dare you call someone without first checking in with them via text or email if they have time available. And that's the way phones were originally invented, so we could communicate verbally. So a lot of the, you know, what I notice in, I, I coach also, so I see these kids, and I can literally tell a kid that has a phone 
from a kid that doesn't have a phone. Mm -hmm. And thankfully at our school, we don't have a lot of kids that have phones, but the ones that do, they they react differently. They have different attitudes. Mm -hmm. They say things that normally wouldn't come out of a 12, 13 year old, Mm -hmm. because you know that they've been exposed to things that they probably shouldn't be exposed to at that age. I think the other thing that I learned from the book was how important it is to for us to be educated on what these social media companies, these pornography companies, what their their goal is to get yeah. you hooked, right? Mm-hmm. These algorithms are built, and even for myself, you know, in my work, I do, uh, I, I, I watch a lot of social media. I have to be on social media, and I watch podcasts and things like that. But seeing how smart the algorithm is, you watch one podcast on political ideology next thing you know your feed is full of those things so imagine when it's a 12 13 year old Mm -hmm. who is having some issues with regards to body their their body image next thing you they look at one thing about how can i lose weight next thing you know their feed is full of it and then they're getting videos from girls who tried something so they could lose weight and they're making they're setting all these expectations so uh, it's it's not a fair fight. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got these multi-billion dollar companies designing ways to hook you mm-hmm. and they're not using it. It's not a fair fight when they're using it against developing minds. Yep. Uh, exactly. And that's probably the thing that, that really stuck out to me, how vulnerable our children are, mm-hmm. how vulnerable we are. We see our, I mean, I catch myself sometimes like, oh my gosh, that's the third video I've seen on that. Today I need to get, you know, stop that. Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine that when you're at home by yourself, trying to get homework done by the way you have your computer there so it's absolutely it was an eye-opener for me right so go ahead i'll just say i've got a question um so it's it's weird it's uh, interesting because we all know that this is bad for us right Mm -hmm. we all it's open it's open secret now Mm -hmm. and uh, when i first started taking action to for myself to get off you know addiction to a smartphone i went through a program exodus 90 and you go through 90 days of asceticisms, and one of them is you don't you don't go on the internet, right? And then you mentioned in your story, in two weeks, such a short time, you can notice changes in your children. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering now, as we go, is there any amount of time, or is it just something that we need to completely abstain from? And maybe the technology, right? The smartphone is not inherently evil, but we can't separate it in our world from the intent that you guys are talking about, mm-hmm. that the companies put yes. inside of it. Right. So is there any safe amount of time to really be using these in our lives? That's, right. That's no, that's question. a great question. So with a developing brain from zero to 25, pretty much, or at least let's say 18 till your child's gone, the more you can delay access to the toxic side of technology, the better. Because mm-hmm. it's giving their brain an opportunity to develop properly. And because screen time is actually impairing the frontal cortex from developing. And that's the part we want them to have. That's where their executive function skills live. And that's what they need to make good decisions and you know have impulse control, and all the things that we got to develop as kids and teenagers and young adults for the most part, unless we have trauma or something, but most of us had that opportunity to build that part of our brain. Mm -hmm. That's getting hijacked with kids, no matter what amount of time they're on the interactive screens. So interactive screens are gonna be your social media, your video games, anything you're interacting with. Something that has an ending point, like a laptop you're on, working on a Google Doc, you're writing a paper, that has an ending point. That's not gonna be addictive to the brain. So I think ending point is good. And then going back to what Mr. Coombs showed us, that would not be considered toxic, correct? What, the phone? The, the This phone that's not connected Correct. to... Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So those are just kind of alternatives. And, but still you have with a developing brain with that too, yes. there's still a need to have some parameters around it, right? Otherwise yes. your kid, even with just texting or calling, could be on it for hours at a time Correct. texting right. and that becomes unhealthy. So we want parameters. We want an endpoint. I want to ask about video games. Would it, According to the research of, of your company, are all video games like all bad all the time or is it a matter of limiting it or just do none of it it's really the best is to abstain from any of it a hundred percent hundred percent and and this is why is because the risk is there Mm -hmm. and not every family like especially families with multiple children and i hear this over and over that they might have one that is susceptible to that draw like wanting that you know being addicted to it 
over time. And then the other kids have, they don't care. They want to go outside and play. So there's still that risk. And it's usually the really smart kids, you mm-hmm. know, that are really intelligent that it pulls them in. That And Melanie will say that about her son, Adam. Super, super intelligent. He's actually now gone on to be a lawyer um, for the DA's office and is doing great in that aspect. But very bright minds tend to be drawn in with this persuasive mm-hmm. design that video games. So video games today are nothing like what we grew up with that did seem pretty innocent. And it was kind of like what you're saying with checking social media on your computer, we would go to an arcade, play a video game, go home. Mm-hmm. Or you'd have the old school Nintendo. There'd be an ending. You had the ending point. Any more with games, even educational games, even the Bible app. I'm not saying the Bible app's bad. I'm just saying every I app. I know me too. But every <laughs> app, when you start looking, is created with this persuasive design. And the yes. goal is to keep our eyes glued to it. And yes. that's the same with video games. And so it just can become a slippery slope because of the um, activation of dopamine that's happening in the brain, which I'll go into more. Uh, you know, yeah, I, a lot of games are designed today so that if you take a break and step away, you you lose out, you, you fall crushed. down in your ranking significantly, yeah. mm-hmm. and then it makes it a lot harder. Yeah. So they're, they're designed so that you can't step away, whereas formerly video games were not designed that way. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a good so point that, so there's So there, there, are, there, are, <laughs> there is a difference in, say, the kind of video game mm-hmm. and, and what is being produced now compared to what was produced in the past. And um, perhaps there are companies producing games that aren't that way, but not the vast majority of them yeah. are, yeah. are produced. Well, what's happening is that your a child's addictive. dopamine has, is the baseline has been raised and raised mm-hmm. and raised. So they might start off on something really innocent like Minecraft or, you know, things that parents think are innocent. Um, but over time, their brain starts craving more and so that's going to then push them to those other video games that you know punish them for leaving the game or and, and like i that. did want to share just this something anecdotal um I'm, i was unfortunately not able to have my own children but i have taught kids for 30 years i keep in touch with a lot of them and i have a, a lot of girlfriends mm-hmm. but i wanted to share one story that always uh, stuck with me i have a very old friend who lives in washington dc she feels very strongly like you so she did not let her kids have smartphones and um, boy, it was a battle for her mm-hmm. because her kids were involved in many sports, many activities. Mm-hmm. It was heartbreaking. It was agonizing. It was really rough on the family. But I'm close to her daughter, who's a sophomore in college now. Mm-hmm. We stayed. I confirmed her. We stayed close. Anyway, just to c- kind of fast forward, what I think is fascinating, she's at the University of mm-hmm. Dallas right now. She, her roommates are, were raised the way she was. And she'll she'll send emails or, or call me or tell me, you know, um, what they do for fun. Um, she says that we play in the snow. Um, we stay up late mm-hmm. and bake cookies. We tell each other mm-hmm. stories. It's, when I hear her talk, it's like from, from another world. Yep. Um, but you can, I can just see all that agony, mm-hmm. how it paid off. Just I, I would just say the innocence mm-hmm. compared to, because I talk to a lot of kids mm-hmm. in college, it's a, that's just a different planet that yep. she's on. Um, but it, it wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. But I it's just thought it. that was a beautiful payoff when, when yes. I hear about what she and her friends are doing for fun. Well, so. I don't know. Hallie Cake probably share, too. Mm-hmm. She's 18. Yeah. Was raised without a smartphone. Mm-hmm. And did you survive? Yes, <laughs> I did. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Yes. What you just described is when, let me put it this way. That waiting, that whole, because kids, you, say, you think, well, my kid's going to be mad at me. Mm-hmm. They don't have it. And it's like, well, let me tell you, for a period, if your kid is hooked on it, or even if they're not, there may be. But guess what? Your kid is not supposed to be your best friend. Or the boss. They're your kid. Yeah. (laughs) Or the boss. Yeah. (laughs) You are the coach. And we have to raise parents and a generation and instill in them, like, you're supposed to be the parent, not the best friend. Mm -hmm. Because let me tell you, in my life, if my parents had decided to be my best friends, I would still be hooked to a device, right? But they said, no, like we want to, we want the health of my child's brain Mm -hmm. over blending in with the rest of the culture. Mm -hmm. And did that look like being different than everyone else? Absolutely. And did it pay off? Absolutely. And so this is where, yeah, there is a bit of a fear that's going to come with my kids are going to be mad, but it is worth it. Trust me. Cause like you just said, like, it, it's different, right? Like, there's this, they know how to talk. They know to how to have relationships. They know how to have joy. Joy. Just in the simplest, yes. yeah. simplest mm-hmm. things. Little things. Mm-hmm. Every day is yeah. intentional, mm-hmm. right? Instead of just 
living And don't you see thing? such a difference amongst oh. your own generation? I know my daughter yes. says the same thing yes. amongst her peers. It's like, oh, wow. Once she, and my daughter did have the smartphone for a while, mm-hmm. but once she was detoxed from it, she could look, step back and go, have that insight and be mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize what I was in it and it was yeah. affecting me, you mm-hmm. know? And so that's where the detox comes in. We we call it a detox. We now call it a reset. Um, oh. It's just a way, well, I we've like called it both things. Too, yeah. Reset. We've kind of changed it to reset, so it's not so scary sounding. But that is what you're doing. <laughs> I like think of Russia yeah. and all I know. that, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a different um, conversation. But the 30 day reset is just to set okay. parents up with this like, onboarding because it is really after that two to four week mark depending on how old your children are but especially the younger they are the easier this is mm-hmm. to get them off of it just to go cold turkey when you have teenagers it's a little mm-hmm. bit harder but we map it out for 30 days to tell, show you exactly what to expect this is how your child's mm-hmm. mood will be they're probably not going to like you on this day mm-hmm. you know give them lots of yummy food like you need other ways to give them dopamine so we walk mm-hmm. parents through that and after about a month you really do start to set dopamine reset and you're like, okay, mm-hmm. I can stop playing, you know, board games with my kids every hour of the day to keep them entertained. They're entertaining themselves. It's great. So if a parent was interested in this 30 day reset, mm-hmm. would they have to like register on your website or just read an article? It actually is involved do? in our course. So we so have, have a curriculum. Yep, okay. We have a parent curriculum and then we have our, this is our student print curriculum here. Um, and so it comes with our parent curriculum. And if they were interested, I'm presuming there's a fee. Yes. Okay. Can yep. you give us an idea yes, for our the, listeners? I believe the parent course is 129 okay. on our website. Okay. It's a digital course. Digital I know course. the irony. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that is for we parents. live in an age we of do. paradox. I know. I know. And for the parents, that's just, it's a lot to have to put into a book. But for the parents, it's the modules you click through. It's not like just reading. There's mm-hmm. lots of different um, things mm-hmm. to keep mm-hmm. you hooked. No. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we got to do that too. So that's where they'll find it. And so we just recently came out with being able to purchase that separate. But then we do have a bundle where you can purchase okay. the parent, student, and the friend. So they can go to your website yes. and find, yep. find that out. Org. That's great. That's yeah. great. Um, what is a an, an ambassador for Screen Strong? Well, so I am. My parents are ambassadors. I see. So they were trained. They were. They they give more presentations. My family actually, before we were involved with Screen Strong, started doing um, presentations, and then we realized, oh my gosh. Screen strong, that's literally, they give you all the resources. So that's how we got hooked up there. I, myself, am a Tina ambassador. So my job is to encourage the next generation to make us aware of, hey guys, they're taking our brains, like mm-hmm. slowly. And it's, we need to, I am I'm encouraging, I am supplying these kids with the tools to be able to rewire the brain, because I have. But I also, I'm on both sides, right? I've been on that side where my brain was hooked and then I'm not. Because some kids, right, they can be like, well, you're just telling me, like, you don't know. It's like, oh, but I do. (laughs) And I know where you can, where, where you are, but where you could be. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's for me is I just want to raise up this new generation to fight back because that is what it will take is Mm -hmm. kids saying, stop, you're not going to take hold of my mind. You're not going to take captive my mind. And I'm already seeing it. I was talking with Mandy earlier um, with some people from my college, like being like, oh my gosh, because he, he deleted the apps, social media apps. And he's like, I feel so free. I'm like, yes, yes, what, you yeah, do. And so happens. this is exactly what happens. And so that's what I want. That's, mm-hmm. that's what needs to happen. And so it will, it will take kids saying no more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I like that you use the word free because mm-hmm. we are a liberal arts school. Yes. So everything we do is to try to free the student mm-hmm. to be who they're called yes. to be. Yeah. And while it's not exactly the same, we are very intentional about not being on any kind of device, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's a Chromebook or a mm-hmm. laptop. Oh, and mm-hmm. we invest in real books mm-hmm. in real so human good. to human yes. contact. Yes. Um, we, we invest in those types of things. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, a, it's actually very hard for us. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I come from a family of educators who mm-hmm. say books, like that's ridiculous. That's, mm-hmm. you know, people yeah. get very angry mm-hmm. about books. Mm-hmm. It, it, you'd be amazed. <laughs> um, yes. I, I've, yeah. I've, taken a lot of heat for that but we believe in books in school mm-hmm. so in real people and you would be amazed at how much that shocks people mm-hmm. and upsets people but that's something we, we strongly believe mm-hmm. in which which is why we have you here and which I think it's important to say at our school I think we have a culture that supports being different in mm-hmm. that way yes. and being human because mm-hmm. really what we're talking about is what does it mean to be yes. human mm-hmm. um, and, and go outside and play. 
Yes. Things that I you have didn't stickers. use to have I have po- stickers I'm going to give well, to the kids. Well, we didn't use to have to have a podcast about being a kid and going out and playing. Right. You, know, mm-hmm. I, you know, I used to play out in the street and it was fine. But these are different times. But uh, I think it's important to, to mm-hmm. bring that up. Um, I want to continue to see if any of our dads have any comments or questions they want to add. I wanted to comment on playing outside. Because I think that's so important that, you know, this generation, Gen Z, was really, they, they talk about a lot of things that happened. You know, they, they got the iPhones, mm-hmm. so they went from having social media in their on their computer for an hour a day to having it 24-7 in their pocket mm-hmm. and being, becoming addicted to pornography, social media, or video games. Then it also happened that it was in my generation of parents, maybe you too, Doug, that we're the, the helicopter parents mm-hmm. where we didn't let our kids walk down the street. You know, you don't see kids down, walking down the street anymore mm-hmm. today. Everything is arranged play dates. Kids don't get to know their neighbors anymore. And so so you've got protective parents who are saying, hey, and Jonathan talks about mm-hmm. this. Hey, we, we're, it's too dangerous for you to walk to the park. Mm-hmm. So go to your room and play on the Internet. Which is the most more dangerous thing mm, that that, mm-hmm. that we're yes. exposing our kids to? So does Screen Strong have plans? Because there's so much. You know, it's great that, for example, our school has three recesses. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I love that. which mm-hmm. most schools do not. Mm-hmm. Our kids actually play mm-hmm. during the day, and you know, I've had the pleasure of coaching both of these guys' kids, and you can see the difference in their kids versus the kids that are phone addicted. They really do have that joy, and they love to play. And you leave them alone for a while. And they, they make something up, yes. mm-hmm. right? Yeah. They make Beautiful. something up to play yes. versus pulling out their phones. Our kids, none of them have phones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So even the ones that do have phones at home, when they're here, they're, they're forced to interact mm-hmm. with each other and do things. So you do see the difference versus when I go to other schools and I see other kids, even at track meets. We'll, we'll be at the track meet and our kids are all running around playing tag, throwing stuff at each other and having fun. <laughs> and the other kids are in the huddle all staring at their phones. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it, it makes such a difference, I think, in their development. So my question is, do you what plans do you have? Jonathan talks about some stuff. Does Screen Strong have suggestions for parents on playing more, how to incorporate more play I think your and being outside? your creative play? Is that mm-hmm. right? What yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just letting kids be website. kids. It's, it's knowing what to replace. You have to replace the screen time with something. Mm-hmm. So that's why I joked a few minutes ago about, you know, playing board games with your children for hours on end. You might have to do that at first. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a gal on our site, one of our testimonial videos, and she says, if I have to play Monopoly one more time, you know. <laughs> and But there comes a point where you don't have to, to anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, to this day, them. that's how I know how to count the money. I know, right? <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have lots and lots of suggestions through our parents parent course, through our kids course, through all of our information we have, through our podcast, we've interviewed people with, you know, teachers or early childhood um, professionals, people like that, they give lots of suggestions. But yeah, our biggest thing is go outside and play, be creative, however a kid wants to be creative. I mean, Melanie, through our, um, we have eight lessons of solutions in our parent um, curriculum that literally she tells you how to set up your child's bedroom. Mm. how to set up your kitchen, how to set up like different rooms in your house so that there aren't these triggers to want to go to the Mm -hmm. phone or to the TV. Mm -hmm. And so Melanie's big thing is, you know, always have something yummy out to eat, something nutritious because you got to feed their brain, right? And give them that dopamine, Mm -hmm. something yummy, but nutritious. Um, She's like, food goes a long way. Always have food out. Um, She also says just to keep you know, Legos or a puzzle out on a table, 24 Mm -hmm. set, like just keep things out. Your house might be a little messier for those early years. And I look back as a mom and be like, yeah, I definitely would have had a problem with that because I needed to keep everything tidy. And I wish I would have not been so tight on that stuff and just let it kind of go. Because if there's some cardboard sitting out and there's some paint sitting out, like they're going to play with I those I think you things. should repeat that, give that permission to moms because that's it's a, okay for your very, house to be messy. It, I, and when you change your agony. perspective and you see your kids playing with these things, it it's, brings joy to go, Oh, they're using their brain. They're not on a screen. They're being creative. And then you can actually pat yourself on the back that they're making a mess. And then you get to teach them how to clean it up, which is another great skill that they need to learn, right? Um, you make a mess, you clean it up. So there's all these little life lessons in these things. But I will also suggest, if you haven't heard of 1,000 Hours Outside, have you heard of them? I have not. Yes. Um, Melanie, our founder, was just on her podcast, but 1,000HoursOutside.org. I'm pretty sure it's .org or .com. Um, but she's great. Her name's Jenny, and she has lots of resources for parents it's kind of like a bucket list of how to spend a thousand hours outside like over the summer over the school year all sorts of suggestions so that's when we highly recommend excellent yeah and let grow is another organization that really promotes Mm -hmm. um, kids being outside 
or no? Um, did he start that? No, no. no that, okay, that's so been around for a decade. Okay. Yeah, I feel that, like he's that, talked about um, it. It's called Let Grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lenore Skenazi founded that um, group. Um, yeah, but it was originally she uh, she made a New York Times because her kid like rode the subway. Oh yeah, thirteen or that. something like that, and mm-hmm. in New York City, out. and people so freaked out. So she wrote a, she mm-hmm. she wrote about it, and it was it was fine. Her kids grew up doing that, mm-hmm. and has lo- um, learned to navigate the city. Um, so. I was going to say, that's another, I wanted to bring that up, that's another item that I think the smartphone especially does with all its different functions, like navigating, right? Mm-hmm. It seems, uh, and then and freedom versus being held captive or being held slavery, we kind of give our skills over, we surrender them to this phone, which, you know, whoever makes the, the apps, and we, like, we have this ownership of navigation, reading maps and giving directions and talking to people, and we surrender it and we give it to our phone as we're just renting it from our phones whenever we need to pull on those skills we have to go to the phone right Mm -hmm. it's just it when you were talking about captivity reminded me of that Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. it's so true and so it's important to teach our kids and give them that opportunity like a lot of us had as adults we had that opportunity as kids too we were talking about earlier read a map print out you can still go to mapquest.com and put in your thing and print it out and teach your young driver you know how to look at a map and how to those are actually skills that are going to be very to go out yeah maps and globes love it yes see i love that i love that do you know how to read a map i do know how to read a map (laughs) yes because i did i had i did not i had a phone that was just talking text when i was driving so i did i had i had to learn i had to learn and sometimes it would be uh, my grandpa he would i'd be okay i'm here you know, because I, I could call him, but I didn't have a map. And um, I would stop, and I'd be like, okay, where do I need to go? And he'd say, you know, two miles this way. Then, And I knew. I knew how to do that. But if I had had that map, I I wouldn't have. You wouldn't have had the opportunity the, yeah, to Those skills would have been skill. cultivated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. absolutely. Probably build habits <clears throat> habits of leaving earlier in case you get a little yes. bit lost. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my so God. All great executive yes. functions. Skills. Because yeah. I found this with some of my friends. <laughs> they'd be like, okay, we need to be at this place at a certain time. So they'd put it into their map. And say it'd take 10 minutes to get there. So, like, okay, we need to leave, you know, whatever mm-hmm. time. And I'm like, no, we need to leave way earlier than that. Yeah. I was like, traffic. And they're like, no. Our phone says it'll take 10 minutes. I'm like, that's no. not that's not real, guys, I promise. <laughs> that's the real world. No, yeah, no, exactly. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. So, little things like that. And I think Pope Benedict writes quite a bit about mm-hmm. it, you, not knowing the distinction between what's real and what's mm-hmm. not real. This mm-hmm. is very mm-hmm. The worlds are getting mixed. The virtual Problem world and the From all world. of this. Um, I did I did want to forget to ask you, you mentioned the frontal cortex. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything else you want to tell us specifically about what happens to the brain? Yeah, sure. Um, so the brain is developing from the back to the front. So the back part, the cerebellum develops first when we're born, and that's why our kids love to move. That's the movement part of our brain. The middle part of the brain, the limbic center, is in charge of our emotions. That's where our, our amygdala is. This is very well um, developed by the teenage years, and this is why teenagers are very can be emotional or (laughs) drama and you know that's just you got to get through those teenage years if you're fighting this phone battle just get through them and they will have the insight later because what then starts developing later and gets fully connected is that frontal cortex and so that really is not fully developed till about age 25. Um, so when we're handing a smartphone to a 12 year old, 15 year old, I mean, they've got a good 10, 12, 15 years left on their brain, you know, to get that part of the brain that we really want to be strong to make good decisions. So what's happening with the interactive screens that kids are on is that it's, it's impacting the frontal cortex. It's shutting it down. And so when we say to them, what were you thinking? Or why did you talk to that stranger after I've told you a million times not to give somebody your information and you did anyway, they literally could just say, I don't know. Because they probably didn't. In that moment, they they didn't have, they weren't able to see the consequences ahead because mm-hmm. that's just not developed yet mm-hmm. in their brain. So it's really unfair that we're, te- we're treating our children as adults before they're ready. Mm-hmm. And that's what's happening when we're giving them this addictive technology and mm-hmm. expecting them to manage it. Treating expecting them like them adults. Before mm-hmm. they're ready. Mm-hmm. And expect expecting them to manage it. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's really yeah. something to think about. And one thing, other thing I'll mention too is... The question comes up a lot about balance. Well, shouldn't 
don't we just need to balance this? I mean, this is how it is. Technology is here to stay. Don't we need to teach our kids how to use this? Mm -hmm. And so what we say with Screen Strong is we can't balance something that's toxic for us. And you would never give your child just a little bit of heroin every day to teach them how to use it when they get out of the house, you know. (laughs) And that was something Melanie had said to me early on. And that clicked in my parent brain personally. I was like, oh, my gosh, you're right. Like, I can't be hurting their brains. And so we don't balance something that's toxic for us. We balance good things in our Mm -hmm. life. We don't balance toxic things because even a little bit of toxicity is not good Mm -hmm. for our brain. Mm -hmm. And I was going to, I was going to ask that too, because uh, for the parents, you know, we've got some parents here that are pretty strong in their decisions not to give their kids any phones for that period of time. Um, But then as Dan said, you can, you know, you know, that, you know, the children that probably do go home and have phones, right? So I was going to ask, is there any, can we be without it here at school and then go home and use it a little bit? Um, But yeah, not I really. No. Yeah. no, there's not really any balancing it. That's, I love when I find schools that are phone free, um, and so many more since his book has come out are going phone free because that's at least giving them that break during the day. Mm-hmm. Because the average time, I think it's like seven and a half hours that mm-hmm. kids are reporting they are on social media during the school day, <laughs> during the school day, and so you're like, when are they learning? You know, so I love when schools at least give them that break. Um, but if parents could also not do it at home, that'd be great. Or go to a gab phone, go to a light phone, go to, there's other options now that were not available even five, six years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if you phones. saw in our office, our kids have a vintage phone, you know, the, oh, the, the no, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. That. is that what they call me on? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have, we have, <laughs> a a line. Phone. <laughs> we have a line just for the kids and it looks, I love you know, that. those phones that looks like from those old movies and they, they have it's to do like it. really hard for them, you know, mm-hmm. but it's really fun to watch them. That's and so then great. I have a few that love it and I'm like, you're just here cause you want to be on that phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's you fun. just like it, <laughs> um, you know, and the, so, you know, we, we do that to try to make it a little more. Oh, I love that. Human, a little more interesting. Yep. Anytime um, you can go retro, that's what we tell kids and I'll tell the students. That. I'm like, go retro. It's fun. Go get yourself a record player. Go to yes. Goodwill and look at records. I mean, this is a fun hobby. For Our kids whole now. school is Goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone lo- yeah, loves to thrift. Yeah. So um, and my kids have been at this school, I think this is their 14th year, and they've never seen a kid pull out a phone in all that time. And look at it. So we're we're pretty blessed, um, but a lot of a lot of parents aren't willing to be the only one in their neighborhood. So um, Jonathan Haidt talks a lot about how this is often a collective action problem. Yes. Mm-hmm. If we want to change the culture at large, we need to um, get a lot more parents on board. I, I think um, the statistic he tends to cite is like until you get about. 30% of kids ha- already off the phone, mm-hmm. half of parents won't even consider it. Yep. And so is there anything that uh, we can do to um, make that 30% more visible if it's mm-hmm. already at the school or to um, get to that 30% mm-hmm. to give the average parent permission to take that phone away yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and go through that hardship because they don't want to be the only one. Yeah, no, and, and that's a valid point. I and mean, that's a lot of the, we have peer pressure too as parents, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why I buckled finally at 14 because I'm like, oh, everybody else is doing it. I just, I got to just do this, Mandy. You can do it. Um, I will just go back to our education. That's really what it takes. It's educating parents. So whether that's gra- grabbing some parents even after the workshop tonight or, you know, some have you people have watched this podcast and you start, getting the conversations going, have a book club of some sort or a weekly, you know, where you're either going through Anxious Generation, you're going through our parent course, taking a chapter at a time and educating together because mm-hmm. you can hear all of this and know mm-hmm. in your gut, like, yeah, I probably need to do something, but what do I do and how do I do it? Mm-hmm. And having that like-minded community around you makes all the difference. Mm-hmm. We do have an online forum called Connect that you can get on through our website that's not on social media, and it's a great place for parents to meet other like-minded parents. Um, and I think we probably have a space for New Mexico, so if you guys can always hop on there. Um, we are, if I could bring it back to the ambassador thing, we do um, train ambassadors. So if you're passionate about this and want to become an ambassador, that's also how these movements get started in places because we have a representative here that says hey i'm an ambassador for screen strong i'm going to facilitate the course let's do this together but i would say education is key you have to keep educating yourself on what it's doing that's what's going to empower parents to make change 
You know what? You're making me think this is totally different because I'm a different generation. But when I, I think I was in sixth grade, I, I loved playing with dolls. Mm-hmm. I loved playing with dolls. And I felt, because everyone thought that was silly, and I just felt the pressure, I guess, and I stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wish that there would have been some kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of community or some kind of vo- voice of authority that would have navigated me through that better because mm-hmm. I think um so it was okay to keep playing with yeah, yeah I just think I think things would have been better if I had so it's not technology but I just think in our modern times these things against uh, childhood mm-hmm. just keep getting stronger and stronger yes. and stronger and and I agree with what mm-hmm. you were saying um young people are really going to have to take a, st- a stand because mm-hmm. it really does have long-term consequences yep. in these formative years it does so, well, I want to say thank you to everyone for sharing your thoughts and, and coming to our school. And, um, yeah, we're very grateful for this conversation. It's not an easy conversation. Mm-hmm. We haven't solved everything. But I think I feel really confident that we have given people a place to start, mm-hmm. you know. And, um, yeah, we just got to start help. somewhere. You no matter where somewhere. you're at on the journey, mm-hmm. yeah. you, can, it, you control what you do today forward. Mm-hmm. So for parents mm-hmm. that feel like the cat's already out of the bag, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. You can look at my story and say, okay, she did it. I did it. We took it back and my kids are okay for it. Um, and I still have a 16 year old that has a gab phone who wants a smartphone. Okay. I'm still in the thick of it as a parent, mm-hmm. even though I do all of this and have done it and he knows this, he still wants a smartphone, you know, so I'm still living it out. And tell our audience if they don't all know what's a gab phone. So the Gab phone is Gab Wireless, um, and it's a talk text phone, kind of similar to the Light phone, except it's a normal size phone. It's a Samsung. Um, yeah, this is a Gab phone. Oh yeah, there you go. Oh great. So, so yeah, so it intel. just allows yeah, it allows just a different option for students to have, so they don't have to get that smartphone. There are a lot of other resources too. Um, <clears throat> Jose Briones has a um, a dumb phone finder. He calls it on his website. We can put that in the show notes. Um, oh yes, I've seen that and before. So, That's great. And um, also, mm-hmm. Screen Sanity has a, a little kind of worksheet to help uh, people, parents, walk through the different options like Pinwheel, Gab, and Trimmy, and Bark, um, and also just you know, kind of a selector like everything from a home phone all the way up to you know a, a regular smartphone. What are the different options for parents? So there, there are a variety of of resources that parents can look to, um, I think Screen Sanity has, I think, mentioned them, Jose Briones. So we'll, we'll put some of those hopefully in the show notes mm-hmm. so parents mm-hmm. can, can find that as well. Yeah. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we'll see you next time at Raising Saints and Forming Scholars. Thank you.